So um, I'm going to keep my introduction brief. Um, no jokes this time, or at least not too many. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming, um, especially the young people, because you guys represent the future of gaming. Um, I'm going to encourage everyone, after this is done, to speak to one of the board members, Samantha, Grover, Gunner, Connor, about how you can become more involved in the IGDA. Um, it's because the efforts of our team that we're able to bring great speakers uh, to this area and to provide you with pizza. <laughs> that alone merits your support. Um, for those of you who heard my talk on the business of games, you know that the introduction of digital distribution marked a major change in what games are made and how many are made. You can uh, divide the industry into two eras, before Steam and after Steam. Um, in many ways, the development of Steam as a store and as a platform gave rise to the modern indie development community. Night Dive Studios is one of the many companies that has been able to achieve success by working with Steam. Tom Giordino <clears throat> has contributed to that by helping us with sales, reports, understanding trends, and listening to our complaints, our very many complaints. Tom has been very patient with us, um, with me in particular. Thank you. With that said, let me turn things over to Tom. Um, Eric is also here. And thank you guys for coming down. Hi, you guys. Uh, uh, like Larry said, my, my name is Tom. I've worked at Valve on the Steam business team for the last uh, six years and change. Uh, kind of on the right-hand side, your left-hand side, is my colleague Eric Peterson who's been in the industry for a super long time and works on Steam and some other stuff at Valve with me as well. I want to start by thanking all of you for coming out on a random Wednesday night to talk about PC games. Uh, I know you guys all have other stuff going on, your own jobs and hobbies and everything else. Uh, and I also want to thank Larry and the rest of the IGDA for inviting us. We really appreciate it. It means a lot, and we're, we're super grateful to be here. Um, before I start, can I, I just like please participate in this show of hands. Raise your hand if you have ever uh, published a video game anywhere, whether that's like on the Google Play Store or on Steam or anywhere else. OK, cool. And raise your hand if you're actively developing a game by yourself or with a studio. Huh, all right, that's awesome. Uh, and last question, just to check. Raise your hand. There's no pressure here. If you have a Steam account and you're familiar already with the Steam platform. OK, that's cool. Uh, depending on where we are on the planet, sometimes we have to back up and say, we started this little thing called Steam, and it's a digital distribution platform, and here's how it works. But usually in the States, people are pretty caught up already. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of background on Valve, because we think it's really interesting, and it's worth kind of sharing a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we have I kind of made this general list of five really common questions that we tend to get from developers who are relatively new and are trying to think about how to launch their first or second game on our platform. Um, those answers and, and uh, general topics can be a little dry, <laughs> and they're super Steam specific in terms of the actual info we're going to put on screen. But I think you'll find, I hope you'll find, that A, you have the opportunity to ship your game on a bunch of other stores and platforms as well, and you should take that opportunity if you get it. And B, a lot of this stuff is broadly applicable. So the things that are going to help you reach more customers and uh, get your game in front of more people on the Nintendo Switch or uh, a console or on the iPhone are probably also going to overlap significantly with Steam. We might call our features something different. There might not be an identical match of every single tool or API call or whatever. Uh, but all these things are going to be hopefully broadly applicable, not just on Steam but everywhere. Our favorite part of these events is kind of at the end. Eric and I are both super excited just to hear, literally, tell us about the game you're working on. Tell us about things you're uh, excited about or, or have worked on in the past um, and are working on in the future. Or any complaints, questions, critiques, things you want to know about Valve, things you want. If you're playing Artifact and you love it and you just wish we would do X, let us know. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. A little bit about Valve. Uh, first, the company was founded in 1996 which as I look out, there's, I think there's at least a few people in the room who are not, who, who Valve is older than them, uh, which is awesome. The first game that Valve came out was a little first person shooter called Half-Life. Came out in 1998, Eric and I didn't work on it. Uh, we can take no credit for how awesome it is. And in the years after Half-Life, 
we shipped a bunch more games and we started thinking more about games as sort of an ongoing thing that customers interact with over time by doing things like modding or experiencing new stuff that the developer had built or finding new ways to play online and play multiplayer. Uh, and we realized that the current model of going to Walmart and buying a disc and putting into your computer, uh, the days on that were numbered and it offered a lot less flexibility to game creators. So we built a set of tools kind of for our own games like Counter-Strike uh, and Team Fortress and others and slowly sort of pushed those out to more and more other developers and publishers to the point that now they're openly available to anybody and we call that set of tools Steam. We have around 360 employees now. We're all based in Bellevue, Washington, right outside of Seattle. Um, and almost everybody at the company works directly on our products. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap, by the way. So I mentioned Eric. He's actually a really fun example for this sort of thing because he works really hard on Steam and manages a bunch of relationships with developers and publishers. Um, so he's working with people like CD Projekt Red to help bring their game Thronebreaker uh, from the Witcher IP and launch that on Steam. But he also does a ton of events work for us. So we have big games that run successfully as esports like Dota 2 and Counter-Strike, and he's helping organize and run those tournaments um, broadcasting, finding agreements with different event hosts and tournament runners, et cetera, et cetera. And that's pretty common at Valve. A lot of people wear a lot of different hats. We work a little different from most other large companies in the industry. We don't have a formal hierarchy. We have a lot of personal autonomy and freedom. So Valve employees get to choose what they work on and when to work on it. Um, employees are very self-directed and self-motivated. And our customers are our boss. Um, so the really common thing at Valve is for people to get together in a room and say, our customers are frustrated by some problem or developers are frustrated by some problem. How do we solve that? How do we leverage the existing technology we have, our own skills and expertise? How do we learn from other people in the community to go solve those problems? That's really nice because it contrasts a lot with what can sometimes be more uh, common, which is that a senior vice president walks down the hall and tells a room full of people they have a new goal or a new project or objective. Um, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but we found the more self-directed path to be super productive for us. And we're always hiring. If you're interested in, in working at Valve now or at some day in the future, let us know. We'd love to talk to you more about what we look for and what we value. So we're here to look briefly at the current landscape, talk kind of best practices answers to a bunch of really common questions. There's a lot of themes that develop when indie developers think about their games, not just on Steam, but elsewhere. Um, but there's probably also a lot of uncommon questions that you have and no other developer has. So hopefully after the talk, we can dig into those as well. The next few slides and a lot of this stuff is fairly direct uh, and again, fairly dry. It's really like, how do you leverage Steam? How do you take advantage of tools? I'm gonna go quickly through all that so if there are certain elements, if there's a feature that you, you know, jot down, if you want to take a picture of a slide to remind yourself and you want to ask us more specific questions about it later, don't be shy. I'm going to try to keep a really good pace just for the sake of getting to questions a little sooner. Um, so Steam is, is big and growing. This is a graph of our daily active users over about the last four years. Uh, back in 2014, we were just hanging around the 12 million daily active users. That's people signing into Steam to play a game or buy a game or interact with their friends or earn trading cards or whatever the case may be. Um, we're closer to 45 million daily active users now in the middle of 2018, towards late 2018. Um, but those four years are a really interesting period for smaller game developers because they're the same four years roughly that a lot has changed. Um, Steam in 2012, 13, 14 looked a little bit like uh, the left side of this image. You had way fewer games being made in the marketplace in general. This was a time where engines and tools were not free or easily accessible. There were way more barriers to entry. There were way fewer places to ship games. Um, and we on the Steam team at Valve had way fewer tools to give developers. So developers would submit a small number of games to us we would whittle that down to an even smaller number that we had the time and bandwidth and ability to ship on our store. So if you were one of the small number of customers that saw you know, Civ 4 come out on Steam and you already knew you wanted it, you were really happy. <laughs> but if you were an indie developer making a more niche title or you were a customer coming from maybe a different part of the globe or with a different set of interests, uh, you were a little heartbroken. You might end up being kind of left out in the cold. 
When you fast forward to today, through a lot of pain and learning and challenges, uh, we're far from perfect, but we figured out a way to take the insane amount of great games coming out every week um, and put them in front of a much more broad and diverse set of customers in a more customized way. So there's a lot more games coming out, but instead of showing the same 10 games to all 12 million daily active users like we used to, we're showing an insanely diverse set of games customized to every single user who loads the store. Which means if I load the front page of Steam when I'm logged in and you load your front page of Steam, we're going to see a few of the same games that are really popular or on sale right now or just came out. Um, and the other 80, 85% of the content we see is going to be super different based on a lot of factors that I'll talk about later. That's been especially important because we have such a diverse and insanely broad set of content on Steam coming from a lot more developers. Uh, when we worked on the platform in 2013, 14, we basically wouldn't even talk about Asia as in terms of developer outreach because we didn't have any developers in Asia or Southeast Asia bringing games to the platform. We now have a lot of the top games on Steam coming from territories like Malaysia, China, Indonesia, uh, who really had no access to the Western market. And that goes both ways. There's now a lot of users in those territories who are accessing games made by people in Las Vegas or Berlin or Peru. And we're really excited about that. Um, a lot of the games in this slide are the sorts of games that probably never would have had a chance to ship on Steam in the old model, where we were trying to handpick the one game a month that we were able to ship. Um, and now we're bringing a way more diverse set of content from a much more diverse set of creators. And that's led to more successful releases overall. Um, this graph does n is not a guarantee that you will make money on Steam or anywhere you choose to sell your game, but it is a landmark thing for us to look back at. It's the chart of games that earn over $100,000 in US dollars in their first 30 days on the platform. Um, and as you can see, that number has continually increased even though there's a more and more competitive set of games on the platform. We think that's really good news for game developers and customers, but as a reality check, it doesn't mean that the landscape isn't incredibly compl uh, complicated and competitive. So I'm going to transition a little bit into kind of some of those common questions and what I hope are useful answers to those questions. Uh, again, I'm going to speed through it, so if you see anything that you want to learn more about, just take a picture, make a note, whatever, and we'll talk more uh, later on. The first question that we get really common, especially if you're a first-time developer, is when is the right time to announce my game on Steam? When should I start talking about it? Um, and we've built in sort of a, a release flow in Steamworks to help you answer that question. When you first set up your app ID in Steam, that's sort of what we call any individual product, whether it's a software or a game, you're going to have an app landing page in Steamworks. Many of you have already gone through this process yourself. Um, you can work through a, a really simple checklist of stuff, upload it, submit it for us to review. Um, we check that everything is uh, in, in order and we approve it, and then your page goes live. You will really want to think about this aspect of getting your page live pretty much as soon as you're willing to talk about the game publicly. If your game has a website or a Twitter account or you're telling your friends about it at an IGDA meeting, you probably should have a coming soon page if that's possible. Uh, look, if you don't have a name for your game yet and you don't have any artwork, that might not make sense yet. But uh, I think a good rule of thumb, again, is if you've got a Twitter account or a website or any other presence, if you're going to game shows to talk to publishers or other devs, it's probably worth having a page up because customers want to be able to find that game too. That's really important because one of the things customers can do with a coming soon game is add it to their wish list. Again, like this is a cheesy thing to do, but do you, if you're a Steam customer, do you have a wish list? Do you add games to your wish list by a show of hands? So use your own, use this room as a good guidance of, yeah, the people who spend money on Steam add games to their wish list. You want a piece of that action if you can get it. Um, and wish lists really matter. It's an opportunity for you to start messaging your game and building a community on Steam. And there's a bunch of ongoing cyclical things that feed into visibility. The big one is uh, when you release your game, for the first time, everybody who has the game on their wish list at that time receives a notification email. So even whether that's 100 customers or 100,000, every single connection you make, every marketing effort you have for your game, you want to use that call to action. Go wish list the game on Steam so you can find out when it comes out. Because if you're like most game developers, you don't have a great answer for when am I going to be ready to ship. You can maybe say, oh, it'd be nice to release in the summer or next year, but who knows if that's going to happen. So. 
The other nice thing about wishlists is that they really stick with users. We just uh, earlier this year revamped the entire wishlist page, so there's a lot more filters and features. And we deliberately push through wishlists to customers at a bunch of other later times in the lifecycle. For instance, um, if you have a game on your wish list and it goes on discount, you get a nice notification email that says, hey, this thing on your wish list is on sale. We do update visibility rounds, which I'll chat briefly about later. Those show up to wish listers and game owners. And we even provide you on the financial pages of Steam a tracking tools so that you can see what's working and what's not when your game isn't even out yet. This is super useful because what you'll find is a lot of the assumptions you might make about marketing your game will end up being totally untrue. Uh, a popular YouTuber will cover your game and it'll get 150,000 views and you'll think, oh my god, that's amazing, that's going to convert so well. And you'll look at this graph and see that none of those people actually landed on your store page and wishlisted the game. Or the opposite might be true. Uh, some You'll go to a random IGDA event, and you'll come home and have 100 new wish lists because something you said to other customers or developers really resonated with them. So you can track this on an ongoing basis. And you'll learn a lot about how to market your game before it even comes out if you're paying attention to this data. Question two, should I localize my game? This is a question that we get uh, even more so from developers who are non-English uh, speaking territories. They know that they kind of want to target English, but they're not sure how to think about other languages. Um, and if you do like localize your game, what impact does that have and what languages should you focus on? Uh, Steam is a huge worldwide store and a massive number of our customers are in other countries. We support 28 different languages uh, natively in the Steam client and we accept payment in more than 41 currencies. So Steam at this point is an extremely global marketplace. And what a lot of uh, game developers sometimes don't realize is that every customer has their own language preferences on Steam. Whatever uh, you first downloaded the Steam client in is, is going to be your default. So if you were in the United States and you downloaded the client in English and launched it, your preference is set to English whether you went in and added it or not. But you can also add Russian or Ukrainian or simplified Chinese, and all customers can. And we take that language preference into account when we make recommendations. So customers are mostly going to see recommendations for games that have interface support in their language. It doesn't mean you'll never show up to a user who views the store in Korean unless you have Korean, but most of the time that's going to be true. And it's going to take really powerful things like being a top-selling game or having lots of other friends who play the game to uh, break through if you don't have language support, because we want customers to be happy with the games they buy and likely to buy the games they see. Another big takeaway is that less than one-third of Steam customers have their primary language set to English. So if your game only supports English, you can cross out two-thirds to three-quarters of the market. Not that you'll never sell to them, but they're very unlikely to ever see your game, and you don't want to miss out on that. This is a more current breakdown of users' primary language on Steam. As you can imagine, English is extremely popular, as is simplified Chinese. Our platform has been extremely successful in China and continues to grow. Um, but a huge uh, proportion of our overall audience is speaking non-English languages. Uh, how to target these languages is going to depend tremendously on the game you're making, the territories where you're able to market it successfully, uh, the content itself. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can gather data and think about this problem. We did sort of a general averaging survey of games on Steam. So this is not a guarantee of what would happen to your game if it's currently on Steam. It is an average change for games that add language support post-launch. So this is revenue growth in the regions that speak a language if you add that language post-launch. English is by far the biggest. It's probably not going to be a very big problem for most North American devs. Korean and simplified Chinese are the next biggest. And this is the increase in revenue you might expect on average in Korea if you added Korean language support, for instance. So it does make a difference, both in terms of who sees your game and who buys your game. This is probably the root of a, uh, a huge number of the questions and concerns that developers have for good reason. How much visibility am I getting on Steam? Do I have any way to even tell? Uh, we've built out a huge number of tools to help you track your store page traffic. And I'm always shocked at how many developers, even if they've been shipping on Steam for a long time, have no idea these pages exist. They're really easy to find. Right on your app landing page, you can click Marketing and Visibility Data, and it'll take you to a page full of, you guessed it, Marketing and Visibility Data. Um, but as game developers, especially if you're working by yourself, making your own art, 
frantically thinking, oh shit, how do I localize my game all of a sudden? You're not always going to take the time or have the wherewithal to go in and check this stuff, but it can make a big difference. The traffic breakdown pages help you track visits from different locations across the Steam store, um, and we've added a few brand new features to make it even easier. If you love digging into data, you can now pull down a CSV for any time span you want to run your own analysis. Um, this is a close-up view of some of that data. This is what a, a recent game that launched, uh, to be perfectly candid, it was a, a game that marketed itself quite well and had a lot of name recognition and sold quite well in the store. You can see kind of how your visibility will decay over time after your launch visibility changes. You can see your click-through rates immediately right on the page. So it's going to solve a lot of problems and answer a lot of questions for you that you um, are going to have when you're getting ready to launch your game. We also built in a very recently, I don't actually know for sure if this has launched or it's going to launch in the next week or two. A, a guy we sit next to uh, has been working on this for a while and it's going to launch soon if it's not already out. And it is the community side of visibility. So as you probably know, if you have a Steam account, um, you're playing a game and your buddy Eric starts Artifact, you get a little toast that says, Eric is now playing Artifact. He's drafting a new deck, whatever the case may be. Um, we've always shown that in Steam, but we just very recently have started actually tracking it and displaying the data to our partners. So you can see where your game is appearing in the Steam community. If you can't this week, you will be able to next week. This is what the more specific breakdown shows. I don't know how well you guys can see, but gray on blue is a, is a tough uh, slide backdrop here. But this shows things like um, co the community friend activity feed that every Steam profile has. Items like, uh, my friend purchased a game, uh, a screenshot was published for this game, an item in the community hub was favorited, somebody posted a user review, and how many impressions and page visits that uh, generates. So now that you can go in and look at all those pages to see where your game is showing up and know, oh, I got 100,000 impressions on the front page of Steam today, the natural question you're all going to want to ask is, well, how the hell do I get even more of those? Um, and that's a really complicated and extremely important answer. The first big thing that a lot of devs assume because of how other stores work and how most stores have worked for, uh, since the dawn of time is we don't sell any advertising. We're not striking a backroom deal with Bethesda where they pay us money and we show off their game more than yours. Um, we don't and have never taken ad dollars and it's not a way that we're interested in monetizing. We're not sure how many developers and customers know that or just assume that we're like all other stores and we're taking ad dollars, but we think it's important to call out. Uh, the store is personalized for every user. So if you, you know, open the Steam store in incognito mode in a browser and then you sign in, you're going to see some overlapping games, but a bunch of different ones that are customized to your account, your friends, your language, what games you've played recently, what games your uh, curators that you follow recommend, and so on. And we'll talk through a bunch of that stuff. One big thing that a lot of developers miss, uh, that's easy to miss, is that you can add and remove tags from your store page. Tags are like a really granular version of genres, and every tag has its own landing page on Steam. So a customer can go search for RPG games that have a female protagonist uh, that are dark or funny or whatever, and you can filter by all those tags. You as a developer have total control. So you can go in and add relevant tags for you. And if your customers tag your game with something you don't think is true, you can remove that tag. So you have total control over that. And that can help you show up on a bunch more uh, granular pages on Steam. We also have a feature called Steam Curators. One more uh, by a show of hands, just out of curiosity. How many of you follow a Steam Curator on Steam? OK, so like. I would say almost all of you said you had Steam accounts and more like a third of you actually follow curators, which is pretty close, I think, to our platform numbers. They're really helpful if you follow them. They don't generate too much value for you if you don't. Um, these are human non-Valve entities or individuals that recommend games to you, um, as you would expect. As a developer, you have a tool called Curator Connect. And that's how you find curators that might be relevant to you. You can filter them by genre. You can filter them by language. If you're making a VR game, you can easily find VR curators and so on. This helps you send your, a copy of your game for free, not a resellable Steam key, but a copy granted directly through the Steam client to a curator or a group which can play your game and, and recommend it to their followers if they want. And that plays through to the store in a bunch of interesting places. This is a snapshot of my own Steam front page. I follow a curator called Designer Plays. 
Um, and I have found that the games they recommend tend to be really interesting to me. I don't buy or play every single one, but usually it's been really helpful recommendations for me. Because I follow that curator, a huge portion of the games on the front page of my Steam store are recommended from that curator. So it makes my store experience a lot better, and it also gives these developers a much more granular way to connect with individual customers. Um, we have another feature that we call Update Visibility Rounds. This is an ongoing way to get visibility for your game after release. The whole concept is you released your game three months ago and you're, you're adding a new hero or a new map or you've, you know, you've localized in 10 new languages. Who knows what the case may be. Update Visibility Rounds push your most recent announcement to the front page of Steam for uh, people who own your game already or have it on their wish list and it gives you a nice little screenshot of the game itself and a synopsis of your most recent update. Um, this is an ongoing tool that you can use throughout the life of your game, so it's not something you'd use on launch day, it's something you might use three months later. Uh, tied in with update visibility rounds is the ability to do time-limited branding or artwork, uh, especially if you have an event or a tournament or a meaningful update. Um, we call it an artwork override. So you can jump into Steamworks, upload new capsule art. They show up from 10 a.m. on Tuesday until 11 p.m. on Friday when your event ends, and then they automatically revert back to your original art. Super useful uh, for you. One of the newer and more exciting features for us has been Steam Broadcasting. Steam Broadcasting has existed for a long time, but it was always initially kind of a one-to-one -one way to share gameplay. So I'm playing a game, I'm about to get to the boss battle, I want my friend Gunner to be able to see, oh, I'm about to you know, beat this level or, or accomplish this thing inside the game. Um, and we've slowly built that out and expanded it to make it much more of a marketing tool for game developers. So you have the control now to do a dedicated broadcast as your own, you know, as a developer account, or add a streamer or influencer or Larry from you know, whoever uh, can come and broadcast the game for you and have live gameplay showing up on your store page. Uh, this allows you to chat with viewers if you want. You can add moderation. You can stream directly to a store page, to your own developer landing homepage in Steam, DLCs, etc. Um, and this is not an exclusive or Steam specific feature. So if you do all your broadcasting using some other software and you're already targeting Twitch and Mixer and Caffeine, Steam is just one more place that you can target with that broadcast. If you don't own that software and you don't have a cool setup and you want to use Steam, we make it really easy to jump right in, but you certainly don't have to use our broadcast tech to get the videos to show up. We think that's really interesting because uh, we're, we're leveraging it for really big events. This one, the Make Love Not War from, uh, from Sega, is you know, a massive event across a couple gigantic franchises, but it's just as relevant of a feature for a small developer. And there's now a dedicated space on the front page of Steam for popular broadcasts. So on a random Wednesday night, if you start broadcasting gameplay and you've got a thousand people watching, you're also going to show up on the front page of Steam to a ton of customers. Creator Home is something that's going to be a lot more relevant probably for lots of you as you continue to build a brand and a business over time, but you can set one up whenever you want. It's a customizable homepage for developers and publishers, lets you create lists and catalogs of games, show off what's popular for you. You can send a live stream directly to this page. So if you're working on the second game in a franchise or a sequel, you can use a page like this to collect all that content. Users can follow you directly, and it's also a place for you to plug your Discord channel, your Twitter channel, channel, whatever else you use to communicate with customers. Another relatively new feature is uh, rich presence in Steam chat. This little screenshot I, uh, had to, I, I made like two days ago because I had some friends playing Artifact, and I thought, ooh, this is going to be a good example. <laughs> the way rich presence works is exactly what it looks like, makes it much easier for your game to show off a special piece of content in the Steam community. So you have a really easy and localizable way to tie little chat tags like this to in-game events. So if somebody is fighting a boss or has just beat a level or is drafting an artifact deck, um, you're able to see that and present that to their friends and other customers. We could probably talk about how do I get more visibility on Steam for, for hours, uh, but we're, for the sake of time, move on. The last question, which is like, hey, how do I even find out about this stuff? I didn't know this existed. Um, I heard you guys added a new currency to Steam. Where do I even get that information, et cetera? Um, three really simple websites that I strongly recommend. Partner.steamgames.com is the homepage of Steamworks. 
This is a page for you to go to if you're brand new and you're like, dang, what is Steam? Maybe I wanna sell my game there. This is where you could get started and onboard. If you're already a partner, it's the homepage where you can see announcements that the winter sale is coming. We just announced that the Lunar New Year sale is planned for early 2019, so you can add a discount to your game. This is where we announce important changes and even just more conversational updates and new features that we ship. So it's worth bookmarking and just checking the Steamworks homepage once a week. Every announcement we make in our official developer forums plums right through uh, to the homepage of Steam. The next link, steamdevdays.com, is a little bit shameless because I worked really hard on Steam Dev Days and I really want developers even years later to go back and watch the content. It's a conference that we held in Seattle, had a lot of really smart people uh, doing talks about all manner of things ranging from uh, anti-cheat to optimizing your servers for online multiplayer. I have a talk about, hey, how to make the most uh, from the business side on Steam. There's panels about what we learned from early access, et cetera, et cetera. All those talks are free to watch, and all the slides from them are available as PDFs, so you can reference them. And then finally, the last page is the documentation page. If you go to that documentation page and type in a keyword like visibility or curator or discovery, you're going to find helpful articles that are going to explain more about our tools. So uh, that was a speed run. And I wanted to first say thanks again for hosting us. It really means a lot that uh, you guys are, are willing to let us come and chat. Um, we would love to talk. Eric, again, is in the side. If, it's, if you guys are interested in doing like a more formal Q&A, if people have questions that they're excited to ask in front of the group, that's awesome. If you're like, yeah, I want to ask a question, but I don't want everyone else to stare at me when I do, uh, that's fine. We'll go grab a piece of pizza and a soda and everything else. Yeah. I don't know if you're just buttering me up or if you sincerely mean that, but uh, it's something that we talk about a lot. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not the same as a GDC or a PAX where it's like an annual conference and happens every year. It's something we put together when we feel like, gosh, there's a critical mass of information to share. The last one had, was anchored really heavily by the launch of consumer-facing VR. So a couple tiny little products called the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift came out. And we worked really hard on a bunch of tech uh, involving those products and some games too. So we kind of use that as an inflection point. I think the launch of our official Steam China platform with Perfect World next year is probably going to be another big inflection point uh, and give us more and more excuses to do another Steam Dev Day. So I appreciate the feedback. It's something we're thinking about. Um, and we would love to see a bunch of brand new or, or uh, younger devs showing up. And if you couldn't make it to Seattle, we're also, like always, any of these conferences we do, we'll put all the content online afterwards so that you can benefit from it even if you're not physically there. Who else has questions? Questions about working at Valve, questions about your game on Steam, anything. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a totally fair question. So one thing I, I think it's worth just saying and acknowledging up front, we've known everybody at Epic for a long time. Their CEO was a speaker at Dev Days. We think they're a super smart group of people. They've made some amazing games. They have some awesome tech. So like we're excited for them, and we think probably all of that extra competition in the space, that's going to benefit customers uh, and, and force a lot of players, Valve and otherwise, to continue to be competitive. Um, we have what we believe a really valuable set of services and tools that we offer to developers. And so uh, there's a lot of things that roll into a revenue share that most developers are probably not going to think about. Um, one interesting example for us that, that is, doesn't encapsulate this whole topic but is worth thinking about is something like 
uh, wallet cards at retail. So if you go into a Walmart and you see a Steam gift card on the shelf, um, those aren't free. <laughs> All of the costs associated with that comes out of Valve's portion of the revenue share. Depending on where those wallet cards are, what country, what currency, what retailer, that can be north of 10% um, that we eat. And we think that's really valuable because come Christmas time, millions and millions of dollars flows from those wallet cards into royalty payments to developers. So we're super happy to take on those costs, but we also think that probably a lot of those features and value disappear at a much smaller revenue share. So our big goal is making sure that we're clearly communicating all the value that we think we provide um, and offering a huge amount of services and tools and features. Um, we did announce a few broad strokes changes to the revenue share tiers um, that w I would love to talk about more if, if anybody's curious about those choices because it's really interesting stuff for us to work through. Um, the other big way we want to continue to compete is by looking at what the future is for PC gaming and continuing to invest in it. Um, we look at a lot of games and tools and features like things that are fairly common now and almost taken for granted, stuff like the Steam Workshop for mods, um, that just didn't exist. And it was a really valuable thing to help Valve specific games uh, make modding as a, an experience better for customers and better for partners. Uh, and so we did a bunch of work to make that a generalized feature that now any customer and any partner on Steam can take advantage of. Um, we think there's a lot of other platforms out there who don't offer those sorts of services and probably won't for a long time, which is an interesting trade-off. That said, I said this at the beginning of the talk, if you guys are working on a game and your goal is reach a bunch of customers who will play the game, um, or your goal is make enough money to invest and buy the next game, uh, we don't think Steam is the only place you should sell your game. And we work hard on tr trying to find interesting ways to make our own content available in other places. Um, I would strongly encourage any of you, if you're working on a game, whether you sell that game via free Steam keys from our platform, we cover all the bandwidth and royalties and fees, and we don't pass any of that cost on to developers. So you can sell your game at an infinite number of stores for free thanks to Steam keys. There's also a bunch of other great stores in the PC space. If it was me, I would think really hard about trying to get my game onto the Switch, onto consoles. If it's a good fit, I would think about shipping my game on the mobile stores as well. Um, those rev shares and deals are gonna vary dramatically from store to store. Some stores are, and platforms are probably gonna offer more value than others, but my advice would be think really hard about making your game as accessible as you, as you can. It's a really long-winded answer. Yeah. Oh. No, it's yeah. It's a really good question. I mean, one, one of the, uh, the the question is like, how, how many wish lists do I need to be successful? The, the follow back immediate to that question is like, what does success look like? Because I think if you're a studio of thirty people and you need to make ten million dollars in royalties this year to keep the lights on and you know make payroll, your the answer to that question has to be super different. I think a more interesting thing. Uh, not necessarily more interesting, but another way of approaching that question is twofold. Uh, the first one is, okay, how many, like, what's a realistic forecast of units to sell? Um, what's a normal wish list conversion rate? Talk to other devs who have already shipped products and say, hey, do, you, do your wish list convert at 1%, 5%, 10%? That's actually a, a change that we just made a few days ago was to remove confidentiality from all the sales data that you have on Steam. So if you want to make a blog post about your wishlist conversion rates or your sales over the last five years, whatever you can, I would definitely find that data out and say, okay, if I need to sell 5,000 units this year and I have 1,000 wishlists, like I'm in trouble, I'm nowhere near. Whereas if you're like, I'm hoping to sell 25 units of my game at launch and you've got 1,000 wishlists, you're in a great spot. Um, I think a lot of the games that are probably gonna end up on like the popular new releases or top sellers queue, it's you know in more of like the mid five digit range, so somewhere between north of 10,000. But that's not a benchmark that we're looking at as like, oh, you have less than X wish list, like you're not recommended to anybody, or oh, you have more than Y wish list, you're recommended to everyone. Uh, we're not really big on thresholds. They're also really easy to manipulate. Um, so we deliberately try to avoid telling developers, you must have this number of sales or wish list to be successful. Um, but it would also be really interesting to look at your game right now. Um, one of the fun things when you have a coming soon page, I sl showed this slide earlier, is 
you can actually see the wish list behavior over time. So if you take your game and you spend a bunch of time and money to go to PAX in Austin and you show your game to a ton of people and you come home and you check the wish list data and it hasn't changed, I think that's the thing to make you scratch your head and say, what, what's going wrong here? Is, is the name of my game hard to spell? <laughs> can customers not find it? Or like, you know, did I, did I turn people off with a really difficult tutorial so everybody who tried my game decided they weren't interested in it? Like, I talked to 10,000 people, not one of them wishlisted my game? Like, what happened? Um, or similarly, yeah, you wake up one morning and see 10,000 new wish lists and you didn't do anything. Like, what random streamer in, uh, you know, in Russia was talking about my game last week? Like, how the hell did this happen and, and where are these customers coming from? And how do I make one of those bumps happen again next week? So, any other questions? Yeah, all the way in the back. Yeah, yeah, it was a little crazy. We're we're way more settled in now. Mm. <laughs> really good question. The we use the word cabal uh, basically interchangeable with team. So literally, like Eric and I are talking about um, the game awards, and we're going to broadcast that event on Steam. They're going to announce a ton of cool stuff from. You know, everybody from Epic to PlayStation to Xbox to a, t a bunch of tiny indie guys and everything in between. So uh, there's people who are sitting in a different cabal from where Eric and I sit down on the 12th floor. And we'd literally say, like, oh, do you guys want to go down to the other biz cabal on the 12th floor and talk to Sean about that broadcast? So it's like it could literally just mean room or team. Um, if you have a question about the artifact launch, you go to the artifact cabal and talk to the people there. Um, as far as personal training goes, we, we have this really generous benefit where there's an opportunity to have uh, personal training and physical fitness. We really try to take super good care of employees and make sure that they're healthy and happy, that their spouses and children are healthy and happy. I am super lazy and don't take advantage of it at all. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like generally speaking, kind of like, yes, it's always nice to incrementally improve. Is there, are you thinking like when you buy something, it takes too many clicks? Are you thinking as a developer in Steamworks, it's hard to navigate? Like, what would you point at? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's something that, that is not an uncommon topic. I mean, one of the funny things about being a leader in digital distribution is that we built a bunch of tools and processes when buying stuff on the internet wasn't that popular. Um, it wasn't normal to buy something on the internet when Steam started, and it was even less normal to buy something that was purely digital on the internet and have it downloaded to your computer. That was an insane concept that could never possibly work until it worked phenomenally well for, for a bunch of people. So the only reason I bring that up is I think we do have a lot of like technical debt and cruft from like, oh, like, what, what should we have a customer do when they buy something digitally? And there's a ton of innovation from like the obvious folks like an Amazon all the way down to smaller stuff like Etsy that makes buying stuff on the internet really smooth, much more intuitive. Um, I think we have a little bit of that in the mobile client, uh, but it's kind of missing from, from Steam in general. So it's something we talk about a lot. One of the things that can be really challenging, uh, this is this is a call out, a topic that game developers have raised for us before that I think is interesting for us to work on. Imagine you're playing a free to play game and you wanna buy something in that game and the game presents it to you and you're excited about it and you click on it and you don't have any money in your Steam wallet. Well, you're probably like five or 10 clicks away from being able to actually buy the thing because you're gonna have to add money to your wallet and then it's gonna loop you back to an original screen while you'll have to confirm the purchase again. Like it's more clicks than most people are used to with e-commerce. So the that was a really long answer. The short answer is yes. <laughs> and if you have feedback, by the way, just if you're a UI designer or if you're just a customer who buys a lot of stuff and you're like, man, this sucks. Like send us an email, talk us through it now. I think we're always looking at simple ways to get better. 
Ah, that's a really good question. I have, this is like kind of cheating. This, this feature is not new, it's already out, but we haven't really talked about it that much, um, which is forum moderation. This is a thing uh, from folks like Eric and myself going to events like this one, hosting people at our offices uh, in Bellevue, talking to developers about what scares them, what challenges them, what frustrates them. And this became a really popular theme. And I think it's worth sort of owning and acknowledging this is not a Steam specific issue. This is the internet over the last five years, um, really having a much more challenging time dealing with A, toxic, unwelcome behavior in general. Uh, and to be perfectly candid, I think that's even worse if you are any sort of minority or if you're female or whatever the case may be. Um, and then the other side of that coin, honestly, is uh, deliberate attempts to manipulate things. People who are uh, you know, trolling on purpose or trying to get a rise out of somebody or trying to cause problems. We heard a lot of complaints and fear from developers about that. So we built out a new set of tools and we also uh, have a lot more staff, actual human beings, who if there's a post on your hub that you think is inappropriate, violates our terms of service, you can flag it, report it. Uh, a human being paid by Valve is going to be looking at that post and saying, hey, that's totally unacceptable for our community. That's gone. Um, it's also something you can turn off, which some developers choose to do. They say, no, I don't want some arbitrary third party saying what's OK and not OK in my hub. That's up to me. And we think that's cool, too. So you can go right in and turn that off if you'd rather us not help you moderate. Um, I think the other big one that I, I sort of acknowledged and touched on is uh, we're working really hard on our platform growth in China. So uh, Valve has a really long history and long strategy of growing our business in China. We've launched our own games over the past few years officially in mainland China, um, both Dota 2 and Counter-Strike um, with a partner called Perfect World. Uh, those launches helped us learn a lot of really hard, challenging lessons and sort of insulate our partners from a lot of pain. And then it helped us figure out, OK, when it's time, we can launch Steam officially in China with this partner and benefit from a lot of our learnings, a lot of the infrastructure gains. Um, people like Eric are working really hard because we recently announced that our Dota 2 International, which is our big uh, kind of the, the keystone tournament for uh, our game Dota 2, that big tournament is going to be in Shanghai this year, which we're super excited about and is a big step for our platform. Um, so that's still a there's not a lot of ton of specific details I can share, but it's I think a really big step for us as a platform to have an official onshore partnership uh, for the business to keep growing in, in that territory. Eric, anything else really cool that we're working on that we're forgetting about? Oh yeah, there's a I I probably have a slide in here somewhere, but I I, I won't bother clicking through. And, yeah, um, we have been guided a lot by our own games, but also by what other partners are telling us. Um, along things like games as a service and games that sort of are ongoing, um, keep getting updated, keep improving. That's a, for a lot of studios, it's a much more sustainable and safe way to grow the business. It involves a lot less risk. You avoid the situation where you're hiring 100 people and then firing 75 of them the day the product ships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a little more sustainable and predictable from a revenue standpoint. The reason we're bringing that up is we're adding a new event system that's going to stack on top of, we already have some tools like events and announcements, and we're really trying to flesh that out to give developers a lot more one-to-one -one connection with their customers. So if you have users who already play or wishlist your game, and you're running a time-limited event, um, we're building out a landing page for customers so that they have sort of like a, uh, just an events page. They can see of all the games I own and play, or games that I'm interested in playing or my friends are playing, What's new with them? What's going on? Is there, there's a Halloween update in this game, and this other game just added a new hero, and there's a tournament in this other game that I can go watch. Um, so a lot of it's really customer-facing stuff. And then all of those inputs are coming from developers like you, who you're trying to grow your business over time, build a better relationship with your customers. Um, we're kind of rolling out some of that event work incrementally. So some of it has already come through in big improvements, like the ability to localize your announcements and uh, and other big communications. Another big piece of that was the developer and, uh, developer and publisher hubs, so you have a dedicated sort of brand. You can also build those pages for franchises if you're coming out with a sequel or you're building an IP, et cetera. So, yeah, good question. Yeah.
<laughs> uh. If you, well, let's see. We have made some changes to the gifting system. So currently, if, uh, if I bought you that gift today and you rejected it, the purchase would just instantly refund back to my uh, payment method or, or wallet, and that would be done. For a gift that was given a long time ago, um, we, we had sort of an older gifting system where you could buy gift copies and just keep them in your inventory. That created a lot of arbitrage problems because uh, people would try to manipulate the store or you know whatever the case may be. It also created a bunch of UI headaches and weird case uh, cases like what you're describing. So I honestly am not sure if you reject that gift, I think the gift will return to your friend's inventory and they will have a gift copy that they can then open themselves if they don't own Magic Pony Princess Palace, whatever it was, or they can give it to another friend who will be much more appreciative of that beautiful gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larry is a Larry is a huge fan of the IP and, and wants to get on that. Yeah. Did did I see a hand closer up? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. It is. It is a major priority and something super interesting for us. Um, pursuant a little bit to the conversation about RevShare, we recently rolled out um, a global change to RevShare terms that's accept, uh, accessible to all partners. So. One of the things that sometimes gets lost in these conversations is for pretty much all stores and platforms, uh, in most cases except Steam, folks are kind of cutting one-off deals. So like the, the deal that a really big game gets to ship on Switch might look a little different than the deal your game might get on Switch because that game has more leverage and more awareness and brings more value to the platform or whatever the case may be. Um, we've always worked really hard to avoid that. We think that games like PUBG or Stardew Valley that like kind of come out of nowhere and surprise us, they deserve just as much upside as you know some other game. So rather than saying, well, you need a billion dollar IP and a team of lawyers to negotiate better terms with Valve, we just said, no, those better terms are actually going to be available to everybody. Um, but candidly and directly, they're very much targeted at a game like the ones you mentioned. Um, we think that those really, really large games are in a lot of cases they'll be the first game a customer buys and the first reason to create a Steam account. And then over the years of having a Steam account, they'll see more and more games and they'll end up buying gift copies of Pony Island Princess for their buddies and you know, like that, that helps us build and grow our platform. So we have one really tangible goal, which is, hey, whether you're you know, Activision or some random indie, if you build a huge game that customers love, we wanna reward the heck out of you. We think that's amazing. And we think our customers love that, and it's a reflection of you know, what our customers are excited about to reward that payoff. We also think for larger companies that are taking huge risks and making big investments, it helps them pencil out that math and say, OK, if my revenue share gets better over time, it makes more sense to put my game not just on one store, but on more than one store, so customers can buy the game where they want. Um, so that's a, a big piece of a broader effort from our team to say, look, what are we doing to make sure that Steam is invaluable to developers, regardless of their size? Um, we, want, we want customers who open the Steam client to find the best games in the world that are going to delight them. We're actually not that picky about whether that game came from uh, a, a college student in Las Vegas or Bethesda. We, we think both of those games have equal value and have deserve equal shot at showing up to the right customer. Um, so. That's the big play. It's tied in with a lot of other longer conversations and effort on our part to just make sure Steam is, is friendly and supporting developers. The other big one, to be perfectly honest, is all of that global expansion work. Um, processing payments in foreign countries is crazy hard. Getting your store priced in 40 different currencies is crazy hard. And almost no, no other store on PC that I know of gets anywhere close to it. Even the really successful ones like a Battle.net, like they don't even come close to reaching customers in a lot of those other territories. And they're not open to smaller developers anyway. So we think that's probably going to be a, a huge answer is when we gain revenue over time, investing it back into the platform, making it an even bigger opportunity, and also opening our doors to the developers that are in those other territories. 
because there's a lot of game devs in Malaysia or Kenya who have a ton of value to add, a ton of creativity to bring, and they're going to delight customers all over the world if we give them the chance to do that. I think you had a question, right? Yeah. Ah, I was like, I was like looking. I was like, this is weird. This is the longest we've gone without. Uh, no, no comment, nothing in interesting for us to share about any new games. We did release a game recently, it's called Artifact. It's a card game. Um, if you played Magic the Gathering, uh, one of the lead designers of that game named Richard Garfield uh, has worked with us for quite some time on this game. It's in the Dota 2 IP, uh, but it's pretty different from Dota. It's kind of like a deck building and drafting game. It's amazing, uh, I'm a little biased because I sit <laughs> one floor down from the people who built it, but I think it's a really good game. Um, we were pretty quiet, I think, about launching it. We didn't bang a bunch of drums or, or, or show it off in a super aggressive way, and we don't buy advertising ourselves, so you're not gonna see it like on a high rise in LA during E3, um, but it's off to a really good start, and we're really excited to see where it goes. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, so we, we have a, a team of build reviewers that uh, are honestly kind of, kind of, it's kind of amazing. Whether your game like only supports Windows 64-bit or your game supports literally everything and in, is able to be played in VR, et cetera, we will, um, a human being will download that game, launch it, play it, They'll read the store page and say like, oh, you said there's like 10 boss battles? Like, let's see what those 10 boss battles are. And if there are no boss battles, we write back and say, hey, <laughs> you don't have to have boss battles in your game, but you can't lie to our customers. <laughs> so uh, that's true whether the game is VR or not. Um, one of the really fun things about VR games lately for us has been our own huge technology investments. So we're building a new set of um, controllers that we call Knuckles. We sent out I don't know, 300, maybe maybe 400 sets of knuckles to developers based on those experiences where we would try a VR game and say, wow, this would be really cool with some of the tracking and finger presence that our hardware brings to the table. Uh, it's actually a really, I think you can probably look it up and see videos now. I think most of the uh, dev kits are not covered under NDA. You sort of uh, slip it over, over your hand and your fingers are free. You can grip and hold the controller and it's got buttons and a joystick or a, a touchpad, but the controller itself is also tracking your finger motions. So, uh, and the controllers also have haptic sensing, so like you can pick something up in VR and squeeze it and, and crush it, and the controller knows that you're squeezing or releasing, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, you're thinking like m Minority Report style. I mean, it, it depends on what a game developer builds, but yeah, that's kind of the point, is to give you finger presence uh, that's really, really well tracked and instantaneous in VR. I don't work on the VR space at all, um, but I have done a bunch of test playing with Knuckles, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, even, even just playing you know, older games, like we released a game called The Lab, where you get to do cool stuff like shoot a bow and arrow, and, um, or even experiences like Google's Tilt Brush. All those still work in Knuckles, so like a lot of the experiences that are already out there, there's just a little bit more fine motor stuff. But the new things being developed to take advantage of it are, are really exciting. Yeah? You've been talking a lot about how um, developers and people on Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. So we, we kind of start from a point of saying, let's try to make sure that as many tools and features are available to as many developers as possible, and, um, and then be reactive if there's problems that are actually affecting customers. So there's one set of uh, you know, question marks that people have of like, oh, what if somebody uploads a bad game to Steam? Uh, the actual response is like, well, what's a bad game? Because what you think is a bad game is really different from what I think is a bad game. Um, so there's some amount of, of figuring out, giving customers the right control to say, hey, show me this type of game, but not that type of game, which you can do now. So if you feel like, hey, I really, I'm actually not interested in early access games. 
I don't want to buy a game that's in early access. I don't philosophically agree with that. You literally are one checkbox away from saying, don't show me early access games anymore, which is pretty cool. Um, the other piece of it really, though, is trying to f dial in the balance to make sure that uh, sincere, well-intentioned game developers have as much freedom and leeway and opportunity as we can possibly provide without creating a bunch of negative economic incentives to manipulate things. Um, so stuff that folks like Eric and I work really hard on thinking about like, hey, how do we review and approve Steam key requests to make sure that people aren't um, abusing our customers or our generosity or, or manipulating our store in some way? Um, we've had to make a lot of incremental changes over time to when trading cards become available to games, how achievements show up, how game count shows up, um, whether, you know, a, should a user review count if the Steam user didn't even buy the game on Steam and maybe it's just the developer's little brother uh, with a Steam key leaving a review? How do you measure that? Um, so I think it's less about us assuming that we know what everyone's going to do and instead acknowledging like, hey, when we innovate and add something new to the platform, there's going to be wiggle room where we figure out, oh, okay, we're actually going to have to loosen up this, you know, and tighten down that and make adjustments. We don't have the same, um, we don't, I think, pressure ourselves to say, oh, we have to know every single consequence of this action before it's made. We're really comfortable reacting to problems as they come up and finding different ways to solve them. That sometimes makes, you know, an angry Reddit thread complain about something that people aren't thrilled with. And we think that's a totally legitimate way to provide feedback and help us make smarter decisions over time. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, so one of the one of the I think really fundamentally important things for a company like ours is uh, treating employees fairly based on you know the merits of what they bring to the table and and frankly being open minded. <laughs> we have a small enough company that you you can't afford to have a team or a department that has a toxic culture because if one team has a toxic culture, the co whole company does. Um, so we have a, a lot of benefits and insulation against those problems that much larger organizations are going to struggle with because they're so much more isolated and fragmented. Um, we have uh, a small number of internal efforts and, and energies to make sure that we're, frankly, paying attention. Um, it's really hard to talk about that stuff more, more broadly. We think about it a lot in terms of like, hey, what is the broader landscape of the Steam platform and our industry at large? How are we making sure that everyone has a seat at the table? When we do events like Dev Days, uh, are we making sure that a really broad audience of people is welcomed and encouraged to show up and their contributions are valued? Um, but it's, it's easier said than done. It takes a huge amount of work and constantly reflecting on that work to actually make an impact over, over the long term. It's hard work. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's it's um it's something that we we sort of have to dance around a little bit publicly because we don't want to sh share every detail of how we're looking at these things, but one thing that I'll say is it's not uncommon for a group of people at Valve to be looking really hard at a game and a set of reviews and making decisions about banning a developer from the platform for manipulating things or banning a set of accounts that are astroturfing. Um, it's not something we share a lot of strategy on publicly because it's kind of that constant like Cold War give and take thing, um, but it's something that we take really seriously. We have made a few changes. Um, one of the really big ones is just providing customers with more granularity. So when you look at the user reviews for a product, you have a ton of options to filter by like, hey, when did people buy the game? Like, show me the people who bought the game during launch week, not the people who piled on after this recent update or something. 
Um, show me people who speak the same language as me. Uh, filter by customers who bought the game on Steam or maybe people who didn't buy the game on Steam. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near done with that work. Uh, the other challenge, I think, for user reviews is kind of figuring out the, the conventional wisdom, what a lot of people say is like, oh, you only ever leave a user review when you have a bad experience. I don't know if you've heard people say that or if maybe you yourself are that way with a TripAdvisor or Yelp or whatever. Um, I haven't seen the most recent data, but when we looked a few months ago, I think something like 85% of all user reviews on Steam are positive. Uh, and that's a really good indicator for us, and it's not what people assume. I think most people start from the assumption of user reviews are really scary, customers only use user reviews to hurt developers, it's, it's weaponized, it's really negative, but almost all user reviews that get left on Steam are positive because people tend to like talking about the games they really like, which is cool. Um, that said, it's something that we think a, a lot about. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is when users leave really valuable reviews, how do we uh, reward that behavior? Not necessarily financially, but what are the ways in which if somebody leaves a review that's really thoughtful and gives honest critiques to the dev and provides really cool analysis for other customers to decide if they should buy the game, like how do we give that customer a pat on the back? Literally, metaphorically, financially, who knows? Um, because we think that's probably a big piece of the key of like how do you make user reviews uh, valuable? Because not all user reviews are going to be valuable to all customers. So there's a lot of work left to do, but I think that's a direction we're really interested in pursuing. If you leave super helpful user reviews all the time, how do we amplify your voice um, without creating a bunch of negative feedback loops or scary incentives for buying reviews or manipulating them? Um, every time you take a step forward with a really cool program, there's another way to manipulate it or, or make it less valuable. So. It's, it's kind of an interesting Cold War battle. Yeah. Oh, man, this is a really good, this is a really good question. Uh, I, I think that there's a huge amount of it tied to the type of game you're making, right? So if you have, if you have a narrative, story-driven game uh, that a customer might play through in four or five hours, early access is going to be a really tough sell. <laughs> because you will either ship the entire story in one complete piece and there'll be a bunch of missing or, or buggy or problematic things along the way, or you'll ship like chapter one <laughs> and a bunch of customers will show up, play it and be like, wait, where's the rest? How do I, you know, where do I go from here? Whereas I think a more um, endlessly replayable type of game is a really great fit. Two of the early access games that both Eric and I play a lot of, so they're easy for me to talk about, were uh, Dead Cells, which is left early access now, and Slay the Spire, which is still in early access. They are the sorts of games where um, you, yeah, you're going to play them over and over and over and over, and incremental changes actually make the game more interesting. So every time the Slay the Spire devs add a new enemy or a new card or a new relic, I'm like, hell yes, I've got to, you know, I've got to reinstall the game. I've got to play it. They just shipped a really exciting update that I was playing in the hotel room last night um, because I saw an announcement on Steam and I thought, oh crap, they added that? Cool. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I don't know if that, I, I, I would love that. Uh, I spend probably way too much time on my Switch myself, so I'd be thrilled. The real root of your question, I think, is like, do you have a goal of knowing that you have a fun gameplay loop but needing players experiencing it to slowly make it better and make incremental changes over time? Or do you already kind of know the game you're going to make and know the story you want to tell and you want to finish it and put it in front of them you know, fully baked? Uh, we launched Dota 2 in early access because we knew there was an infinite amount of balancing and content additions and changes we wanted to make. And technically, that game has left early access. I don't remember, five years ago or something. But from a practical perspective, we're changing it on a weekly, monthly basis. There's content updates that shift the balance all the time. So in a way, that game is kind of still in early access. That biases me towards thinking like, God, early access is amazing, but we just launched Artifact. It's going to change all the time, and it's not in early access. So the other, the last piece of that question I'll say is I think it's just worth what expectations are you setting in your customer's mind? Are you telling them in advance, I'm a solo dev working by myself. This game hasn't you know, gone through a lot of bug testing. Help me refine it and balance it over time because no one has played it except me versus setting the expectation of every week we're going to launch a new hero for 10 weeks and then the game's coming out. Like, 
having a clear message, setting those clear expectations is essential if you're in early access. And if it's hard for you to write that out and map that out for customers, it might be either a lot of work to, for you to figure out, or maybe you shouldn't be launching in early access. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really tough. I mean, one of the things we found is it's, it's hard to convince someone to buy something. This is true whether you're writing a book or publishing a movie or you're writing music or you're building a physical product. Um, so if you had a five chapter story, fundamentally, it's probably easier and better for you to sell the whole story to the customer one time than try to make five different sales. Um, so I think if I personally was releasing an episodic game, whether on Steam or anywhere else, I would want to sell it in the way that lots of other successful episodic games have been, where you buy the game up front and the episodes ship you know, every week after that or whatever the case may be. Um, on Steam, it's possible for you to break that up however you want. If you want to make five different DLCs, one per chapter, and sell them incrementally, that's totally fine. Um, but that also means every episode you ship is presumably going to have fewer and fewer customers. No one will buy chapter four who didn't also already buy chapter three. So you're probably going to make your business a little bit smaller with every chapter. That might be fine if you are really good at making incremental sales, but it, that's, a hard, that's a hard hill to climb. I'm wondering if, I don't know how we're doing on time. I'm wondering if Eric and I should uh, just kind of like chat more with folks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will also say, with, with uh, extreme enthusiasm here, as tempting as it might be to want to ask uh, a bunch of questions of Valve, make sure if there's smart people in this room that you haven't met yet, go introduce yourself. If somebody else just asked a question that you yourself was wondering about, go ask them that same question. Get insight and advice from the other developers. You'll find the longer that you're in this industry, they are an invaluable resource. Um, and they're going to make you a lot smarter and a lot better equipped to be successful. So be sure that you're getting as much info from one another as, as anybody else. Thank you guys again. You can find me back by the pizza. <laughs>